here is an interesting identity waiting to be proved. Sine of pi over 2020 plus sine of 3 pi over 2020 all the way to plus sine of 2019 pi over 2020. And we wish to show that this is in fact cosecant of pi over 2020. Just to make sure no one is left confused, we are adding 2 pi over 2020 each time we are progressing in the summation. So we are adding 2 pi over 2020 to go from 1 pi over 2020 all the way eventually to 2019 pi over 2020. Okay, so this looks like a pretty awesome identity, but how do we go about proving this? Well, one of the things that you may conjecture is that if the identity is going to hold true for 2020, then it's probably going to hold true for a smaller number, say 4. So to derive some intuition, let's consider sine of a pi over 4, sine of 3 pi over 4, and so on, and let's compare that to cosecant of pi over 4. Well, if 4 is going to be in the denominator of the fraction, then we want to stop when the numerator gets to 1 less than the denominator. So we in fact want to stop at sine of 3 pi over 4, and we wish to compare this against cosecant of pi over 4. Now, hopefully you remember from your trigonometry class that sine of pi over 4 and sine of 3 pi over 4 are square root of 2 over 2. So we have 2 square root of 2 over 2s on the left hand side, and the cosecant of pi over 4 is going to be 1 over sine of pi over 4, or 2 over square root of 2. On the left hand side we have square root of 2, and rationalizing on the right hand side we have square root of 2, so yes, we in fact have the equality. So it seems like we can generalize this, but, but let's stop just a bit. One objection that you may have uh, if you're carefully looking at this identity is that, is that we should be careful to consider when n is even or odd. And that's because when n is odd, we are going to lose some of the symmetry inherent when n is even. To illustrate that, when n is 2020, realize that pi over 2020 is something like this, this angle. Of course, it should be a smaller angle, but for the pictorial demonstration, this should suffice. But if you look at 2019 pi over 2020, realize that's going the angle of pi, then going backwards pi over 2020. So we have the symmetry between the first angle and the final angle when n is even. Now, what happens when n is odd? Say n equals to 5. Then you're going to be considering expressions of the form sine of pi over 5, sine of 3 pi over 5, sine of 5 pi over 5. But what's the problem? We don't even know where to stop. Because when n was even, we knew where to stop. We stopped when the number in the numerator got 1 less than n. But when n is odd, what do we do? Do we stop at 5 pi over 5 or 3 pi over 5? And even if we stop at 3 pi over 5, we are losing the symmetry inherent in the n even case. Because now 3 pi over 5 is not going pi back, then going pi over 5 back. You gotta go back 2 pi over 5. And I leave it up to you to check the direct application of this generalization to n equals to 3 does not seem to work. So I leave that up to you to actually check the inequality. But my point is, if we want this identity to work out when n is odd, we are probably going to have to do more modifications. So for us, in this video, we're just going to focus on the case when n is even. And we will go about proving the equality of sine of pi over n plus sine of 3 pi over n, all the way to sine of n minus 1 pi over n being equal to cosecant of pi over n. Okay, let's get started, but how so? One of the first things that you may suggest is that maybe we can try adding up the symmetric terms. So maybe try adding up sine of pi over n and sine of n minus 1 pi over n using sum to product identity. This idea has its merits, but I'm a little bit skeptical. And that's because if you look at, say, the case when n is equal to 8, if we try to apply sum to product identities to sine of pi over 8 and sine of 7 pi over 8, Remember that we are going to have to add up the angles and we're going to have to subtract the angles. So we're going to get pi over 8 plus 7 pi over 8, which is pi, and that's, that's good to see. You want to see things like pi. But if you subtract, we get pi over 8 minus 7 pi over 8, and that's negative 6 pi over 8. Now if we consider adding up the two inner ones, so if you add up sine of 3 pi over 8 and sine of 5 pi over 8, we are going to get 3 pi over 8 plus 5 pi over 8, so pi is good but we don't get negative 6 pi over 8 when we subtract because 3 pi over 8 minus 5 pi over 8 is negative 2 pi over 8. 
So it seems like we are not going to get too much of a simplification because when we are adding up the terms pairwise like this, we don't quite have the same sum. Now, I may be totally wrong and there may be a way to finish the problem by using sum to product identity and I'll leave that as a challenge. If there is a way, I encourage you to try to find it. But the method that we are going to showcase in this video is not going to be sum to product. We are going to use something different. What's the something different? Well, what kind of summations do we know how to evaluate? We probably know how to evaluate the arithmetic series, and we probably also know how to evaluate a geometric series. But here it seems like we don't have neither of those. But, but not quite, because we kind of have arithmetic series if you look inside the sign. We have pi over n, 3 pi over n, 5 pi over n, and so on. Certainly that doesn't mean the sign of the angles forms an arithmetic series, but at least we have something within sign. But wait, if the angles are going to form an arithmetic sequence, then we can turn this entire thing into a geometric sequence by using complex exponentials. In fact, we can use Euler's identity, which states that e to the i times some angle is equal to cosine of that angle plus i times sine of the angle. So rather than writing sine of pi over n or sine of 3 pi over n, we can work with e to the i times that angle. And now, since you have an arithmetic sequence in data, when we raise e by the power, we are going to get a geometric sequence in terms of the exponentials. And this is one way that we can go about evaluating the sum. So rather than writing sine of pi over n, we can write e to the pi over ni. Rather than writing sine of 3 pi over n, we can write e to the 3 pi over ni, and so on. Now we should stop for a moment. You may argue that rather than finding the sum of e to the i data, we want to find the sum of sine data. Well, we can fix that easily by just taking the imaginary part of the entire thing. So once we evaluate the summation, in terms of complex numbers, we can just look at the imaginary part, and that's precisely going to be what we wanted to find. So let's continue. What do we now have? The first question I have for you is how many terms do we have in this series? Well, we're going to start with 1 pi over n, and we're going to end at n minus 1 pi over n, where we are adding 2 pi over n i each time. To go from 1 to n minus 1, we gotta add n minus 2, to 1 to get to n minus 1, and since we are adding 2 each time in the numerator, let's divide this by 2, which is telling you that if you add 2 to the numerator n over 2 minus 1 times, so if you do it 1 time, 2 times, all the way to n over 2 minus 1 times, then we should reach the end. But we also want to count to 1 pi over n, so the number of terms in the entire sequence is 1 more than this, so n over 2. Now what's the common ratio in this geometric series? Well, we're multiplying by 2 to the 2 pi i over n each time, which is telling us, let's ignore this imaginary part for now, which is telling us that if we actually add this up, we are going to get the first term, which is e to the pi over n i, times 1 minus the common ratio, raised to the number of terms, over 1 minus the common ratio. So this is the standard sum formula for the finite geometric series. And let's see if we can go about evaluating this. Well, first of all, e to the 2 pi i over n to the n over 2 is e to the simply pi i. And e to the pi i, if you remember, is going to be cosine of pi plus i sine of pi. And that's simply negative 1. So this entire fraction simplifies to 1 minus negative 1, which is 2 times e to the pi over n i divided by 1 minus e to the 2 pi i over n. Now, remember that we want to find the imaginary part. We want to find the imaginary part of this entire product. So let's actually do so. So let me go all the way down. By the Euler's identity, we know how to simplify 2 times e to the pi over n i. That's simply 2 times cosine of pi over n plus i times the sine of pi over n and 1 over 1 minus e to the 2 pi i over n is going to simplify to 1 over 1 minus e to the 2 pi i over n, which we know is cosine of 2 pi over n plus i times sine of 2 pi over n. So to get rid of the parentheses, we are going to have minus sine for cosine and also for i sine of 2 pi over n. Now to find the imaginary parts, we want to make sure that we don't have any complex numbers in the denominator. So let's try to get rid of that. 
And to do so, we can simply multiply this entire denominator by the complex conjugate of itself. So we can multiply by 1 minus cosine of 2 pi over n plus plus i sine of 2 pi over n to make the denominator become real. And of course, we have to multiply by the same thing to the top. Now what happens? Well, this part is going to stay the same, pi over n plus i sine of pi over n. The interesting part is to the right. How does this entire thing simplify? Well, we know what happens in the numerator. We know that simply 1 minus cosine of 2 pi over n plus i times the sine of 2 pi over n. Now what happens down in the denominator? Remember that the entire point of multiplying by the conjugate is to have a minus bi times a plus bi become a squared plus b squared, which is going to be real. So we are going to get, here a is this entire thing, and b is this minus sine of 2 pi over n. So we are going to get 1 minus cosine of 2 pi over n squared plus sine of 2 pi over n squared. Let's go down even more. It seems like we can actually simplify this. For now, let's actually focus on this denominator because that seems like the part we can actually simplify. When we square 1 minus cosine of 2 pi over n, that gets us 1 minus 2 cosine of 2 pi over n plus cosine squared of 2 pi over n. And we also have sine squared of 2 pi over n residing to the right. Now, cosine squared of 2 pi over n plus sine squared of 2 pi over n, this entire thing is going to become 1. So we in fact have in the denominator 2 minus 2 cosine of 2 pi over n. So let's copy this all the way up here. So after all of this, we have found that the denominator of the fraction is 2 minus 2 cosine of 2 pi over n. So let's substitute that in. Now let's cancel out the 2's to make the expression look even nicer. So we're going to have 1 minus cosine of 2 pi over n. Now we see something nice. This thing cancels out precisely to give us 1. So this entire thing, let's focus here for now, is 1 plus i times the sine of 2 pi over n over 1 minus cosine of 2 pi over n. Okay, it seems like we are almost there. Remember that we want to find the imaginary part of this entire thing. So what we wish to evaluate is cosine of pi over n times this entire thing plus sine of pi over n times 1. So that's simply sine of pi over n. And we wish to show, we wish to show that this entire expression in fact collapses to cosecant of pi over n. That's pretty marvelous. Let's actually try to finish this. So we want to get rid of 2 pi over n and replace them with pi over n whenever possible. So this brings us to the idea of using double angle identities. So we know sine of 2 pi over n can be written as a 2 sine of pi over n times cosine of pi over n. So we get 2 sine of pi over n times cosine squared of pi over n. And finally, how do we simplify 1 minus cosine of 2 pi over n? Well, we want to cancel out this 1 minus. So we want to use a double angle identity for cosine of 2 pi over n that can cancel out the 1. And the 1 that you probably think of is 1 minus 2 sine squared of pi over n. So by using this, by simply substituting that in, we can cancel out the 1, getting 2 sine squared of pi over n residing down below. And 1 of the sine of pi over n's are going to cancel out, the 2's are going to cancel out. So everything becomes cosine squared of pi over n over sine of pi over n plus sine of pi over n, which is equal to sine squared of pi over n over sine of pi over n. And now cosine squared plus sine squared is 1. So the entire thing simplifies to 1 over sine of pi over n, which is the desired cosecant of pi over n. So we are done. After working through this geometric series and trigonometric identities, we have proved that sine of pi over n plus sine of 3 pi over n all the way to sine of n minus 1 pi over n is cosecant of pi over n when n is even and positive.